Hello, good morning, afternoon. Anyone tuning in to watch this video today is August 19 of 2019. And uh, on another occasion, I find myself strolling through Central Park on this instance at the very southern edge of the park. Uh, this video is being filmed live on Facebook and that within itself is a very unique and interesting experience in the sense that uh, the audience is a little bit different. People drop in and drop out, but nevertheless, if you're tuning in at a future time, uh, take a look at this uh, video in essence and the things that are shown for some very interesting spaces are to be explored. <laughs> many many paths along Central Park in this immediate area the body of water that we have directly in front over here is the pond it is a very warm August day it is uh, close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit and the uh, humidity is well makes it feel like it's almost a hundred nevertheless it's a beautiful day a few clouds here and there and the picturesque effect of the park uh, nevertheless very well felt. This time of year is also nice to come and explore the different variety of uh, pollinators that make their way to the park over here in this area. I could be wrong as to what this is but there's a lot of bees. It's a nice opportunity to appreciate some nature in a city that is always incredibly busy. I want to bring you into this section that we see up ahead over there beyond the water. That's a space called the Hallett Nature Sanctuary. And in it, we are going to explore and look at the trees and particularly take a look at a sample of a tree called Ailantus Altissima. Ailantus Altissima would basically be called in the English language, the tree of heaven. The tree of heaven is a tree that is native to Asia and was introduced to the United States in the 18th century and since then it's become a sort of invasive species but also the subject of uh, very popular works. I'm sp specifically referring to a story that was published in the year 1943, a book titled A Tree Grows in Brooklyn and if you've been following this guy you've seen how um, uh, I blogged about it or posted about it about two days ago as it was the anniversary when this book was published, again back in 1943. And there's so much to see here, I'm already noticing a couple of butterflies, more bumblebees, but actually we are going to move further down this path. We are right by 59th Street on the southern edge of the park. In fact, if we look over here up, tilt the camera a little bit up, we can see the very popular sculpture on the southern end, the Simon Bolivar, that immediate entrance to the park is called Artist Gate. An area that is worth exploring, but on today's video, we're going to keep focusing on the Hallett Nature Sanctuary. Now, let me see if I can get the camera back down. We're walking along the southern edge of the park, and just before we enter into the Hallett, we might have an interesting view of a little plaque that is embedded in this section of this, in a sense, this bench over here. I want to just take a quick look real quick and focus it so that we can take a look. This is pretty much the landscape that we are exploring, uh, represented in three dimensions in this flag that was installed here in 2001 after the pond was restored. And basically what you have is a representation of the last, uh, of this rock, that is basically called oh, yeah. promontory. This is pretty much the rock that we are going to explore and then the water that you see on the flag is because it rained uh, uh, yesterday and this fills up and basically gives you the silhouette of the shape of the pond. So in three dimensions we see this little plaque and what we have is really a representation of the landscape that we have all around us. We're going to keep moving so to go into the rock proper, into the promontory and explore a little bit of the amazing history of this section uh, of the park and talk about its restoration as it was uh, recently restored and uh, talk a little bit about the work that was done and also take a look at that Ailantus Altissima tree or the tree of heaven. There are many trees in Central Park. There's an estimated close to 175 different types of trees and in total over 20,000. And it's amazing because soon after you enter from uh, wherever, really from any entrance, you encounter uh, basically a piece of the countryside in the middle of the city. 
this immediate section of the park again is in the very southern end <clears throat> and uh, just off of one of the busiest sections of New York and from this vantage point here we are treated to a very nice feature I don't know how well it can be seen but this is actually a waterfall there are people on top of that rock this is actually the tallest waterfall in the park and if you were able to explore in the near vicinity where those people are you'll see that there are hoses and pipes and water that feeds that waterfall yes even though it looks natural this is uh, completely man-made <clears throat> We're going to keep moving. I want to see if we can get a nice view of the waterfall from this vantage point, and we can. It's relatively nice. It is torn down and as to the naturalistic character of this environment in the sense that it makes you feel that you are away from the city. We are going to keep walking down and very soon turn to the right, so to enter that very special space, that a space called the Hallett Nature Sanctuary. We'll see a couple of plaques along the way that will shed light on some of this particular space's history because as you see we have to go into the main entrance where this where there's this fence that surrounds it this is an area that was closed off for almost 70 years or over 70 years in fact it was closed off in 1934 and uh, really reopened again in 2013 let us move further down and take a look inside because things are about to change even more drastically than what we've already experienced in the minutes past if you tune in let me know where you are tuning in from if you have any questions feel free to let me know in the future my goal is to make more video walks i apologize that i cannot schedule them so that you know when they are happening but they will be pasted on the timeline and I'll try to make it so that it's a continuous story. So basically the things that I produce connect to the other posts that I post, especially the historical posts. Those moments in time connecting us to when things were created or when incredible things happened. Oh man, I'm just stopping over here to take a look at this bush for, as you see, it has this very interesting pot. many neat wonders that will keep you busy and very interesting flower here as well no idea what that is but now that i've noticed it i will surely ask and learn what that actually is if we were to keep walking straight down here we would encounter a bridge called gapstow bridge gapstow bridge is the popular bridge that appears in the movie home alone to right, lost in new york instead of going straight down there we're actually going to go inside this space over here this is the entrance to the famed hallett nature sanctuary in central park a space that opened in 2013 is accessible beginning at 10 a.m and closes at sundown and inside is where we find that Ailantus altissima tree the tree of heaven the tree that was referenced or used as a metaphor in Betty Smith's book, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, which again published a couple of days ago, back in 1943. There's a plaque or a poster, a sign in front of the Hallett Nature Sanctuary. Here we pretty much see the name of this particular space from when it's open up until when it closes. It's open seven days a week. This reopened in 2013. And since 2003, the Central Park Conservancy had, and students have been involved uh, in restoration work centering in this section that is just four acres of territory. Four acres of territory that were meant to be seen from uh, along the edge of the, of the pond that we just saw where we first started. But beginning in 2013, now this space has become more accessible. In 1934, it closed off completely. This was done during the administration of a city park commissioner named Robert Moses. Robert Moses made it into a bird sanctuary. And for nearly 70 years, this was closed off. Fast forward to 2013, a couple of years ago, and it's now open again. This gate, in fact, that you see is from 2013, but it's... Uh, done it was created designed following original designs actually original illustrations 
or inspired after original illustrations and then just going through the gate we enter into the sanctuary and as you can experience even from this video the view is different the paths are different there are less uh, chairs it's more tranquil and this is something that is very distinctive of the woodlands in central park central park is a big space this woodland is just four acres of territory just uh, north from where i am we have a uh, uh, another woodland that is 36 acres a space called the ramble and uh, just to the northern section close to 110th street there is another woodland called the north woods which is 40 acres of territory central park in itself is a total of 843 acres we are getting to that Atlanta street but before we get there i just wanna uh, well we kind of have to walk this path and if you notice this is different than what I was walking on before. This is uh, what is called forest carpet. Let me see if I can zoom in and take a look at it. This is uh, wood chips that have been binded together using a sort of epoxy uh, resin that keeps all the pieces together. And there's actually several layers to this. And the reason this was done is uh, to create uh, a more durable uh, pathway for people to walk to make it more accessible as well central park has a strong tradition of being a democratic space with this type of uh, uh, woodland carpet we basically have a surface that is accessible for wheelchairs and strollers so if you're visiting definitely check it out you have access to it if you have those confinements and uh, uh, this is something also that helps uh, preserve this landscape for there is very little topsoil here it's always recommended that you remain on the paths because by going off the path, by going to these areas here, we might kill the root systems of trees that maybe come out once every two years and stuff of the sort, or kill the root systems of the trees that are already here. This is a very, very delicate setting in the sense that there is very, very little topsoil. And these paths are non-linear. They curve and they bring you to some very interesting spaces. They give you beautiful views of uh, certain sections of the city and in this particular environment as well in this particular woodland the, Hall the Hallett Nature Sanctuary it's very cool to come and learn about different plants as uh, a lot of them are labeled as you see here this is Virginia creeper that is growing here and uh, a lot of this work this beautiful restoration that you see today was done beginning in uh, really 2003. 2003, the Central Park Conservancy, the organization that takes care of Central Park, that's been taking care of Central Park since 1980, uh, organized for something called ROOTS. ROOTS stands for Restoration of the Outdoors Organized by Teen Students. So yes, what you have in front of you is basically uh, the reflection of work that was done by the younger in our society, a space that was restored after it was closed for more than 70 years. As we keep moving down, we see many varieties of trees. We even see some wildlife as well. There is a squirrel just up ahead. Moving about, it's possible to encounter raccoons in this area and many, many birds. Central Park is one of the most popular birding destinations in the United States. You can spot an average of 250 different types of birds, especially during migration season. I wonder where our little friend, the squirrel over here, is looking for. Very interesting, probably a nut or a piece of food. Plenty of nut trees in Central Park. And the wildlife is definitely sustained with the bounty that is produced every year by all of these incredible trees. It's actually a little bit cooler in this section of the park as well under this canopy of trees it's amazing because if you look up other than uh, particular spots you don't really see that many buildings let me see if i can try and focus but moving around a little bit you can kind of pick up a sense of how removed we feel from from what is characteristic new york city no skyscrapers few sounds 
definitely the sounds of birds and the sounds of nature is what is most predominant. Coming full circle again. Let me now head over towards where that Ailantus tree is located. If you're tuning in and you don't know what I'm talking about, take a look at the timeline, at my Facebook timeline, and, uh, uh, and go about two days back where I posted about A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. A Tree Grows in Brooklyn is a book that was published in the middle of the 20th century. And it's a story that uses the tree of heaven as a metaphor for the difficulties that were endured by the protagonist. It's a very cool book. And here we have a very interesting bird. It's probably a robin. I don't know what this is, it's cute. Oh, there's a bunch of birds over here. It's kind of like sunbathing. Let me see if I can zoom in there. Yeah. This is the Hallett Nature Sanctuary, a place where you can encounter or get this incredible close encounter with nature. There's our friend the robin. There he is. I'm a little bit zoomed in. I don't know how to maybe get it back so that I can focus a little bit better. Let me just try. I must apologize. I do not know how to zoom this out now. back I apologize about that one thing about live video is that any technical issue that you encounter it's happening in real time and it affects the timeline the presentation in general but uh, coming down to this area here it's a bit easy to get lost but the Hallett Nature Sanctuary is not too big it's just four acres of territory you can be in here and if you're just here to see it you can see it really within 30 minutes or maybe 45 minutes if you're really walking down all the paths. This is the most common tree in Central Park. Very mature specimen. This is called the black cherry tree. Black cherry trees are native to this part of the world. However, in Central Park, they are the most common tree, not because they become invasive, but because our birds love the black cherries on this tree here, and they eat the fruits and drop the seeds absolutely everywhere. In fact, when uh, the Central Park Conservancy came into this setting, into this landscape in 2002, to kind of take care of it after a couple of things had happened and uh, to help start the process to revitalize it and make it accessible for people, they found that the most common trees were either uh, of three types. They were either black cherry trees, this one here, Ailantus trees or trees of heaven, and wisteria. Wisteria is a vine that grows very rapidly and is also native to Asia, just like the Ailantus altissima, just like the tree of heaven. The black cherry that we just saw over here is is native to this environment however as i mentioned the birds love them and they drop the seeds absolutely everywhere this is the top of the fountain earlier in the video you saw uh, the, you saw the view from the other side from the path down below and in this setting over here we see the top you see there's a lot of birds uh, taking a bath, taking a shower, enjoying this night atmosphere. Also people sitting down, enjoying their lunch and reading. And in this area here, you see those uh, pipes that I talked about. Yes, the feel is very natural. You feel that you are submerged in nature, but uh, when you take a closer look, you see, you basically see the puppets that pull the string. Here we see the hose feeding with water. And 
water is sliding down through this rock, falling over the cascade and providing for this very naturalistic perspective, naturalistic view. We're going to keep walking down and make our way over to Hackberry Overlook. Hackberry Overlook is the uh, the highest point in this development in this landscape over here but before we get there I forgot we gotta see that tree of heaven that is actually what we are here for today on this particular broadcast again it's a very warm day in New York it is close to 90 degrees Fahrenheit a lot of humidity. August in New York tends to be very, very warm. Nonetheless, even in this weather, a walk through Central Park is always, always refreshing. You always encounter interesting things. See, there we go. We have a here. We have a view of the Atlantis Street. See the one with the many uh, leaflets. The one that is like right aligned with that incredibly tall skyscraper that is being built on the southern edge of the park. There are a couple of Atlantis trees here actually. Let me try and bring the camera back down and get a little bit closer to one of them because the one, the sample that we have over here is very interesting. It's interesting in the sense that it had another invasive species attached to it or kind of like almost choking it out here we see there's a little bird i forget what type of bird this is this might be a robin as well it's walking i'm just gonna get off the path over here just momentarily just so that we can take a look at the sign tree of heaven atlantis altissima that's this tree here atlantis is grow incredibly fast there we have it this one here is also Atlantis This is the bark. And these stripes that you see, these uh, sort of scars, were created by a wisteria vine that, that was growing around it that was almost choking it. Look at this area here where this area is like more bulged out. That's because in this stretch over here. Sorry. That's because in this stretch over here the wisteria was choking it out. Like you can tell the vine wrapping around these formations. Atlantis is also produce a sort of toxin. That so yes, Atlantis produce a sort of a toxin that prevents other trees from growing around it if it's left uncontrolled. In this particular instance here in Central Park, work is done so to ensure that no more offshoots are kind of like growing and spreading that can be a problem if we get too much or too many of one particular tree that could definitely be a problem you get those particular species kind of sort of like invading and taking over that's why they are called invasive species all right we're walking back up we're heading over to Hackberry Overlook to take in the views and uh, see, pick up on this dynamic of this particular space in the park being a double sanctuary. A double sanctuary. You would ask, how is that possible? Well, it's a sanctuary in the first place because in 1934 it was closed off to humans and left as a sanctuary for birds and other critters. But that wasn't too effective. Yes, it kind of worked in the sense that it, yes, provided a habitat but what be, soon began to happen also is that invasive species began to take hold 
And again, uh, when the conservancy came in in 2003, the, most of the trees that were found here were either this tree here, the black cherry tree, the tree that we just saw, the Ailantis, the tree of heaven, or Wisteria. There were other trees, but two thirds of the trees here in these just four acres of territory were those particular three species. Today, with the work that is done, they ensure that the diversity of the landscape is maintained and that invasive species don't take hold. If you are visiting New York, this is definitely a spot that you want to check out. And if you live in the city or are visiting and are interested in a guided visit through this particular landscape or any of the others in Central Park, connect to my meetup page and uh, look up for programming as I organize it and post it up there. And when you come to the park for your guided tour, you will connect with me and I'll show you these amazing sites. Notice this balcony over here, how neat it is. It's made of black locust. And one thing I particularly like is that, yes, that as you're walking, you're gonna have these liners, this line uh, marking the path. And then as you get closer to these balconies, to these overlooks, it's almost as if the wood rises and forms into this beautiful balcony that we have before us. Getting close to these balconies, of which there are several, you get impressive views of the rest of the city. From this particular end, I find myself in the southern end. This is the view of the skyscrapers now lining the southern edge of the park. This is looking east. Up in the distance over there, you see 230 Park Avenue, what is right now the tallest residential building in the Western Hemisphere. That is actually where Alice Rodriguez and Jennifer Lopez live. Apartments up there sell for close to $100 million. There are other prices as well, a couple of million. Beautiful views and then spanning the camera back down, back to nature. Back to nature, back to this enclosed sanctuary that was built for uh, to be a respite for animals, birds, other creatures, a place that was just for them. In the 70 years that this was happening, not too much thought went into that. This was just an area that was closed off, but in 2002, the conservancy comes in and sees that over two thirds of the trees are invasive species, and they start the process to organize it and uh, turn it into this very beautiful, visitable space that we have here today. It's a wonderful section with many messages and different things in bloom at different times, different sorts of berries. We find ourselves on that bridge. So on the, on the previous plaque that we saw soon after we started the video, we saw how this is just one big rock outcropping and at the very top of this, of this rock is this area that we are walking and in this immediate vicinity there's a plaque a plaque that lists a couple of names when we get closer to it we'll take a look this is the plaque that connects us to the dynamic of how this space is a double sanctuary and first dynamic of sanctity is that space that was designated for birds in 1934 and then in 2013 with the new restoration, this space becomes a double sanctuary. The plaque that we have before us over here was installed actually in 2015 and reads the Ma Rock and the Iraj Sakai Sanctuary. Now I know that I'm probably butchering these names. These are Iran Iranian names. The people who are listed here were born in Iran. They were the fathers of a woman named Sima Gadamian. Gadamian is a dealer in rare gems here in the United States, here in New York. She was born in Iran, has been living in New York for a couple of decades, a dealer in rare gems. She provided funding so to create this beautiful oasis, this beautiful sanctuary on top of crowning this uh, natural sanctuary that was originally designated in 1934. 
Sema was inspired by some very peculiar circumstances to create this or turn this into a sanctuary or provide the funding for the restoration of this space. In the literature that I found, I found she had she was visiting friends who later a friend who later died of leukemia. And she said that she was having a very difficult time dealing with the situation, even though she had a strong support network of friends and family that could help her through that loss. And she wondered how much more difficult it must be to people who to go through those similar situations with people for people who do not have that support network how much more difficult it must be to someone who loses a relative and is not able to go to where that relative is or who loses a friend and or is dealing with a difficult situation here in this city and don't have that dynamic of uh, friends in their lives or families in their lives in this particular environment, how much more difficult it must be for them. And uh, so the reason behind the funding of this space was to turn this into a sanctuary for people who were grieving, for people who needed a space where they could basically feel that they are not alone. And this is pretty much uh, some of the ideas that this space embodies with that particular, uh, with that particular contribution. Hagberry Overlook is marked by these beautiful rustic benches, designs that are inspired after original designs given to us by the original designers of the park. As you see, rustic enhances the naturalistic character of the park, and also at this point you can see some evidence of a little bit of wear on this uh, carpet, this woodland carpet that we referenced a little bit earlier on. Uh, at this point over here you can see the wood chip. Some of the wood chip has peeled off and you see uh, plastic netting supporting or holding together a sort of foam material and directly under the foam material there is gravel. Gravel that organizes or allows for this to be a permeable surface allowing for water to be absorbed instead of just washing down and uh, washing uh, all the little dirt that there is here along with it. Hackberry Overlook also has this balcony setting here where we can see the buildings on Fifth Avenue. Definitely a quiet day, a quiet time in this section of the park. It varies, people filter in and out. This is not the most visited session of the park, but if you find yourself here, definitely come and check it out as you will for sure have a good time and will reconnect to the more beautiful aspects of the nature that we have in our beautiful world all around us. I hope you've enjoyed this video tour. Uh, for more videos, tune into the page, like the page, always inspect the timeline so to connect with other stories posted using different media, video or photos or just uh, messages. If you are in New York, uh, connect, your, connect your friends, your family and come on a tour, come and learn about the incredible visual character of this city and the messages that it uh, that it uh, communicates. Sima Gadamian, the person who provided the funding for the organization of this space, for the restoration of this immediate area of the park, can see this area from her apartment on Fifth Avenue. I mentioned she was a dealer in rare gems and she provided the money to restore this section of Central Park and uh, I don't know which, which building she lives in but it could very well be one of those buildings that we see in the distance there and this is just basically one giant rock this is someone that deals with gems, rare gems, uh, precious stones and uh, in a sense by giving it that connection uh, giving that funding to restore this with those very powerful messages behind it, it's almost as if this in itself, this giant pile, giant rock of Manhattan mica schist, this giant promontory, this giant uh, piece, the Hallett Nature Sanctuary, is almost as if it has been turned into a gem. 
And if you look at the connections from the surrounding neighborhoods, you'll be amazed. Uh, just two blocks away from where I am, if I exit the park, I would encounter the most expensive home ever sold in the United States. Central Park was built to be a, a piece of a breath of fresh air in the middle of a very crowded city, but it was also built to maximize real estate value. Just a couple of months ago, a home sold on the southern section of the park, very close to where we are from here, for $238 million. Uh, and if you think of the work that is done and how it's put together, you can see how this is pretty much a gem. And by coming on our tours, following these uh, video tours, you connect to that character, you see it for yourself, and you become it in many ways. I will be going to other destinations in the city and talking about the creative character that define those spaces so that we can connect to this idea further, so that we can connect more to the landscapes that we have around us, and in time begin to see how the reality that we have in front of us is not really uh, independent of us, it's not outside of ourselves, it's really coming from within ourselves. And when you connect to these stories, when you see, when you really, when you hear these stories and you see why these spaces are so significant, it's almost as if you bring these images with you. The people who were designing Central Park said they were building a park, yes, they knew they were building a physical space, but they also said that they were building a collection of mental images. Yes, and Central Park is meant to be a space where you are meant to feel, or sorry, a space that you are meant to bring with you wherever you go. And it works. It's allowing for apartments to sell for $238 million and it's organizing for our democracy to keep expanding and keep organizing. I want to thank you for tuning in, those who tuned in, in and out. Uh, uh, for those of you watching in the future, thank you. And uh, any questions, just post them in the comment section down below. And uh, stay connected for future video presentations. Again, this was a video tour of the Hallett Nature Sanctuary, a space that happens to be a double sanctuary and also a space that features those uh, that tree that is referenced in the book a tree grows in brooklyn from uh, published in 1943. a wonderful afternoon or morning depending where you are or when you are watching and hope to see you in real time here in the park or if not on a future video production have a wonderful day bye bye